And so my eagerness for this next expression of humanity is we learn how to die every single day so that we can be more alive tomorrow without having to wait till the biologic death to see the beauty of everything. Welcome to the Deja Vu podcast, where we believe that living a life of magic can be the default. Join us each week as we playfully and authentically dive into the mysteries of life and explore what it truly means to be human. From spirituality, wellness, and all things taboo, we don't hold anything back. So without further ado, let's let the magic unfold. Today's episode is sponsored by Becoming with a Q. So Becoming is a space for community to come together and to realign what it truly means to be you in the full entirety of yourself before you were told who you were meant to be. This is connecting with the essence of who you've always known yourself to be, but being held in a community of individuals that are pioneers creating an ecosystem to reflect back to you all of the blind spots to create a structure that allows you to genuinely build an authentic life from the foundation up. Becoming host retreats all around the world, also an online community, trainings, and so much more. I truly believe in becoming with my whole heart and soul because I have had the blessing to be able to walk very intimately with the founders of Becoming, Benjamin and Azra, who have single-handedly changed the entire course of my life, aligning me with the prosperity that I have always known is possible, but have never been reflected it through my immediate environment until meeting them. It is truly an honor, and I am so excited that the Deja Blue podcast is partnering with Becoming because it is a place that all of the information that can be absorbed from the Deja Blue podcast can actually be put into real, tangible action steps and allow you to build a life from the insight out that actually resonates with your own heart frequency of truth. The next offering for Becoming is a four-week online program called Becoming Prosperous, aligning ourselves from the inside out with a truly prosperous life and actually learning to understand what prosperity really even means. It goes so far beyond just our finances, truly recognizing that prosperity lives within our immediate friends, how we serve our community, our service to the world, our relationship with our finances, our relationship with our body, our relationship with the earth, and recognizing that how we do anything is how we do everything. And so this four week course is going to be breaking it down right to the bare basics and allowing ourselves to rebuild a life of true prosperity. So if you want more information about it, go check out the link in the show notes. And without further ado, welcome to today's episode. Hello, beautiful bluebirds. Welcome back to another episode of the Deja Vu podcast. I I think that I just have, I mean, I have been all morning in just pure excitement and anticipation for today's guest. I have been deep in the study of, when I say the deep in the study of his work, like a few hours this morning and just sort of like peeling back the layers of the majesty of who this person is and also the richness and how dense the nutrients are that have been absorbed through a life devoted to study to allow us as humans to actually truly walk in integrity in integrity on the planet and to walk the beauty way, not only internally down to the microbiome of our gut, but externally of how we interact with all sentient life on the planet. And he's truly revolutionizing our relationship with health and our relationship with the earth and our relationship with each other, which is so needed in today's time. So it is such an honor to introduce to the podcast Zach Bush, who is got his sacred tushy in the golden hands. <laughs> it's not to be moved now. I have landed. <laughs> we are here in real time. And I have to say on a personal note, you have already in the very short period of time of knowing you and being able to have those moments of interaction in person, you have planted seeds that have sprouted pure inspiration and a redirection in the course of my life. And mm-hmm. there was one of those moments was when we were at Arcadia Festival in Las Vegas and we got to have an opportunity during an Emily Fletcher workshop where we all get to come together and one person out of the four that were in the group got to stand in the middle and then just open ourselves up to receive the reflection of um, what the other three saw in that person and to, and to reflect and whisper in the ears of. And I remember thinking, like, I'm in a group with Zach Bush. Yes, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Give me all the reflections, let's go. <laughs> People pay good money for this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm standing there in the, in the middle of the circle and you looked at me directly in the eyes and then you really connected uh, with your heart and really connected with me and then you whispered in my ear, um, that I have the gift to, um, to, to funnel life in and turn it 
into forgiveness and then fi- forgiveness into beauty and to serve from that place. And you repeated it multiple times. And it was almost like you were speaking to my soul in that moment. And you reconnected me with a very short amount of words with what my purpose is on the planet and ever since that moment there has been a softening in my approach to all of the crunchy things that present themselves inevitably as just the human experience whether it's in personal relationships or just coming up against a little hurdle in the road and I have forgiven deeper than I ever have Mm -hmm. by giving context for what it is that actually comes naturally to me however I'm just placing my attention intention into the direction of that and so Outside of all the miraculous things that you do for this planet and for the people that are around you and also through your message, you've just planted a very potent seed in Mm. a very short period of time in my life that has allowed me to serve in a better way. And so I just wanted to personally reflect Mm. that with you. um, That's beautiful. Yeah, I think one important thing to realize is if you had asked me what did I whisper to you on that day, I wouldn't have been able to recall that at all Mm -hmm. because I wasn't actually, that wasn't coming from me, obviously tuned into you for a moment and we had fun encountering each other in different situ- situations in social situations and everything else, but we had never done a deep dive on our lives. There's no way I could have known that to be your superpower from any interaction we had had. Mm-hmm. And so th- in those years, I was you know, a medical doctor for over 20 years as a primary identity and primary professional kind of <laughs> effort, pursuit, practice, everything else. And what I developed in that time is the capacity to listen to people's other self because people would come in with a huge chart of medical diagnoses and pharmaceutical complications and surgeries and surgical complications and all this. And eventually I got to the point where I didn't even have to look at the chart. I just instead, while they were talking, tune in, like you said, open your heart and just tune into the higher frequency of this person. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, their higher self or whatever that thing is that we might call a soul or whatever is simply speaking through me saying, here's actually your issue and here's how we could actually reframe this whole situation. And then disease would dissipate because it wasn't really a biologic process of presenting itself. It was actually an emotional process that was unwitnessed, un- misunderstood, not seen for what it was. And once seen, everything goes into alignment. Right. And once in alignment, at the energy level, biology can't be out of line. Biology has to follow the energetics. We are not biologic beings. We are atomic beings. We are made of nuclear energy. We are literally light beings. And the biology arranges itself very specifically to our you know, finite expression of an infinite soul. And so what happened to us that evening was just one of those clinical moments where there was so much music and noise and we're in thousands of people and everything else. And so to be asked to go into a space is a unique thing in that. And I was somewhat surprised how effective it was because you spoke truth in and the other two people in that group, we were all speaking deep truth into each other in that, in those few minutes mm-hmm. because we had tuned out the biologic you know, expression of humanity for a moment and tuned into this deeper energetics of reality. Mm-hmm. And you always know you have found truth when it's three words, you know, when it's not a dissertation, mm-hmm. which is a warning to anybody who's ever listened to any of my podcasts because I talk forever. And so you're going to have to find those little gold pearls in all the talking because I say far too many words to be an absolute truth all the time. Mm. <laughs> and so look for it. Be patient with me as I come more into alignment with myself and look for the things that are actually you speaking to yourself. Mm-hmm. And that day you spoke to yourself and you realigned yourself and I happened to be the the mirror you were looking in at that moment. But your higher self simply just knew what you needed to know at that moment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and man, are we getting so close to this moment where that veil has so thinned that our higher selves are talking so clearly to us now and it takes less and less trauma to, to invite in transformation. Mm-hmm. It takes less and less friction for us to want change. Mm-hmm. And this is exciting because I think as we look through human history, or at least my life, I was always waiting to hit rock bottom or smash into the wall at 100 miles an hour before I changed directions. Mm. And that was a dangerous way to live. (laughs) (laughs) 
it, it, your your description really goes hand in hand with exactly what I experienced in the sense of that the mind can't pierce the heart in that way. It can't come and be filtered through the mind. It has to come from a deep level of feeling and listening. Mm-hmm. And when there is a deep level of listening, which is a byproduct of the heart, then that's when we can go right through all of the noise and in within a couple of words, right into the very piece that is needed. And yet I just want to acknowledge how rare this ability to speak from that place is while also have you walk, uh, you having walked a very scientific um, and, 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 and masculine approach in the past towards medicine. And so I'm curious around your take on what it has taken for you to journey, the, the greatest journey we could ever take, that nine inch drop from the head to the heart, yeah. for you to, because I, I, what I'm aware is that your background has come from working more in, in mainstream medicine and then making that shift. So would you be open to sharing a little bit about that journey for you around going from um, a deep level of education to then also being able to listen and, and, and from the silence be able to deliver the medicine? Yeah, I think it began outside of medicine in the sense that I was going to go into engineering. I was just chosen a field towards robotics. I, I was not a great student in junior high, high school, didn't enjoy school at all. Uh, but I loved building things. And so I started a car, you know, a car restoration company, rebuilding classic American cars when I was in high school and spent more time under cars and garages than I did in a classroom during those years. And so I was like the least likely kid in my high school to go to medical school. Like, Absolutely would have been ranked number 2002 in my graduating class or whatever, you know, massive high school. And nobody even knew who I was. I was so not present for the usual high school journey, not just in class, but I was not present socially. Like I didn't do any of the usual social stuff of school or whatnot. And so it's with just a chuckle that I always look at my life now and be like, I just could not have put this together, nor could have anybody on the planet. And I remember the day that I told my parents I was going to medical school and they both, we were standing in the kitchen and like my dad had like a mouthful of something in his mouth and he like <laughs> choked. And my mom was like <laughs> dropped what she was doing and they both looked at me like, you're the wrong kid. Like you're going to just fail. Like you can't, this, do you know what that means? Like, you know, like there was like all this sh- doubt confusion like what like my sister was the brainiac she was the one that was going to be a doctor Mm. or something but I was like not the guy that was going to do all that and so first of all I didn't start in the the right place to stay in in, in western medicine maybe but the real birth of that field was completely in the feminine which was a group of international midwives that I had the opportunity to go work with in the Philippines I, I didn't you know, in a very dramatic fashion of only an 18 year old, I, I had my first girlfriend and she cheated on me and uh, broken all kinds of constructs of my own self and that and all that. And so I came out of this heartbreak and I was like, I need a year off to recover from my, my heartbreak. You know, like it's so stupid on one level, but so true on the other level. And so if I did one thing right in life, it was like to say that to recognize that I was feeling something so big in this heartbreak that I was going to need time to reorient before I could do life and that's how earnest I was I I think that's a funny trait that I have I'm just so earnest about everything like who's really earnest about their first girlfriend in their senior year of high school like nobody (laughs) expects that to last like why was I so earnest like I am dedicated to this person this is going to happen ludicrous dude like and so <laughs> I go into that heartbreak so big and I'm like okay I'm I'm gonna give it to God I'm just like I was very in my most like fervent you know Jesus freak moment of my life at that point <laughs> and I was like you know I could save the world with what all this Christ energy inside of me and <laughs> just make me a, a sac- living sacrifice make me a living sacrifice and I made that prayer and 30 seconds later the phone rings and my dad's like answers and oh hi and then puts my mom on because it's her sister calling or yeah sister uh, in law covering calling from the Philippines long story short like within three minutes of the prayer I'm on the phone with my distant aunt that I didn't really know saying hey do you want to come to the Philippines we need help at this midwifery clinic birthing babies and I was like God, is that you? Like, it was just like so instantaneous and everything else. Like, I was like, I know nothing about babies. Yes, I'll do it. Like, um, and so I worked in a tire, you know, tire facility, discount tire for six months, busting tires, 
12 hours a day to make money to get myself out of the Philippines and live there for six months and work for these international midwives birthing babies in the squats of the Philippines. So it was just complete surrounding with the feminine, all these women who were the, the midwifery care teams, but also these women that were birthing babies in the most dire of human circumstances. You know, we were birthing babies on you know dirt floors and tin shacks that were pouring water in monsoon season through them and like just squalor of, of poverty on one hand and yet the power and gravity and groundedness of these mothers who were so confident they could pull this life into the world despite their situation didn't seem to have any influence on their confidence they knew how to do this thing mm -hmm. and so I was steeped in that and then thought you know maybe I'll be a nurse or something like that I could go into healthcare, but I, at that point I didn't think I could be a doctor and so I started into the pre-med situation, but I, I wasn't good at any of the sciences really at the time. So nobody had actually shown me what science really is. So they were making me memorize science and I'm terrible at memorizing stuff. So, so I became a Spanish major because I love Spanish and all that. So I did Spanish major with a, a minor in pre-med so that I could go do nursing or something like that. And one thing led to the next and, you know, like just little pieces of my mind started opening up as I started diving deeper into science and college. And I started to actually see beauty in it that I hadn't seen before. And so it was a little bit of a slippery slope of curiosity, like what's actually under the surface here? And my two worst, you know, performing courses were organic chemistry and biochemistry in, in those four years of pre-med. And now that's all I do um, <laughs> is those two things because um, it turns out that what you're taught in school is somebody else's belief system or somebody else's experience in science. And what started to happen when I, especially when I got to medical school, I started to experience biology mm. and it was no longer a textbook, but I was steeped in it and I was living it. And gross anatomy was such an extraordinary course where I got to dissect a human body for m four months and mm. you dissect everything, like every little blood vessel and lymphatic tissue and you know you just you dissect the whole body and by the end of that my my engineering brain had been so filled now with a three-dimensional model of what it means to be a human body mm. that I suddenly couldn't fail I aced every class I was in honors across all of my courses and honored all of my clinical rotations like everything in the world suddenly was making sense because I had a three-dimensional experience of mm. this thing called science in some ways and the deeper I got into, you know, the, my research and everything else, the more amazement I had in the whole thing. But the insidious thing that had happened that I didn't recognize at the time is what you recognize, which is that's a very masculine field of science. And so over the course of 17 years of, of continued education, which I kind of just kept going, I, I got my MD and then I got a specialty in internal medicine, then a specialty in endocrinology and metabolism, then a specialty in hospice and palliative care. And so this 17 years of like continued education had, uh, unbeknownst to me, put me in this very tight series of boxes of belief systems about the world that I was in. So I could see all the beauty. I could see, I could see all the awe and I felt so much joy in being a phys physician scientist at the time in, in the university, but I wasn't letting any of it breathe. I think I had it choked down and I was told that I would only be valuable if I figured out how to control this system of life, this system. So I was developing chemotherapy, you know, out of you know, understanding of biochemistry of mitochondria and how they talk and how they, they help end cancer. They're kind of the beginning of cancer and the end of cancer. If you, And it turns out mitochondria aren't actually human. They're little microbes that live inside of us. And so over that journey... I found myself into this bizarre thing of my own depression, my own collapse of joy, mm. and then my failure of health of all my patients that I've been taking care of for you know ten years by that time. And despite all of my education, all of my knowledge, my patients were dying painful, slow deaths of chronic disease that I was just oftentimes exacerbating by the drugs I was using. If at best I was kicking the can down the road of the inevitable and I was not at any point helping these people back towards a path of, of fundamental health. And so it all kind of fell apart in 2010, 12 years ago, you know, that, that, that masculine energy that you're recognizing started to fall apart. And over the next, I'd say six or seven years, I dived hard into the philosophy understanding of the feminine archetype and mm. 
understanding, you know, kind of where I came from, what was the joy that I saw in mothers that were so confident in pulling life into this world compared to the Western mother who's so terrified because the Western medical community has told them it's a disease basically. And you're, it's only through technology you're going to get this baby out of you. And this is not a Western, you know, isolated experience anymore. 52% of births are in China are now by C-section. So we have literally taken this power away from women that you are the creative force, that you are the portal for life to come through and, and eliminating their confidence. We make them very vulnerable to dysfunctional labor and dysfunctional pregnancies. And, and we don't give them a sense that this is your hallowed ground. This is, you know, it's the moment you have your first menses is you're welcoming into a quantum portal between worlds where you are going to pull a soul in here and we would like to come around you as a society and as a family and just freaking celebrate the crap out of you at 12 years old or whatever like my god you've been chosen woman you have been chosen to do something and you may pull a, 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 li a physical life called a child through that, or you may just be a creative force that is renewed every month in your estrus cycle and you're in this hormonal creativity and your womb can bring much more than children through. Your womb can bring a whole new society, a whole new future through you. Man, if that was the 12-year-old girl hearing that, you know, what different journey would she do to her own body from 12 to 18 to from 12 to 28 in preparation for what she wants to bring into this world? So I was watching that all, and then I found out that I, I still was, it was all murky. In five, six years of celebrating the feminine and all of this, so there was still like a couple steps forward, a couple steps back on disease healing in my patients and my own life, you know, dysfunctional relationships kind of resolving and coming to an end so they could show their own beauty and all this stuff to find out that I had left the masculine behind completely and couldn't fix anything with just the feminine archetype. And so... The last few years has really been me re-embracing my own masculine state mm. in the understanding that I can be both and that there's actually nothing wrong with masculine energy except that it was wounded and nobody ever went and, and allowed for the healing of the original wound. And so what you see in Western medicine that you recognize, that's a very masculine dysfunctional thing. It's because that's the wounded masculine expressing itself. What is the wounded masculine? The wounded masculine is the one that thinks it's gonna, it's responsible for fixing everything. Doctors have the highest suicide rate outside of farmers of any other industry mm. because we're told you have to fix people and you never can because you're not their source. Mm, it has to come from them. It has to be them direct to source. Mm -hmm. And so we commit suicide in our perceived failure of this wounded masculine that can't see it. And that's not just men with you're born in that wounded masculine. Any woman entering the workplace today in Western or Eastern civilization is pretty much forced to express the wounded masculine. An egoic construct, you have to go fight for everything. You have to be stronger than everybody. Don't be afraid. Make other people afraid of you. You know, these are the traits of the wounded masculine that are expressed in all of society, not just Western medicine. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to refresh the model of it's not just the rise of the feminine that we need right now for this new expression of human society. We need a healing of the, the masculine as well. Mm -hmm. And so it will be when we heal the masculine and then let the divine feminine flow through each of us that we will, we will express it. We are going to express something spectacular. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so that's been my, my journey. As you ask, uh, I, I'm finally finding myself into some version of energetic completion to open a new chapter of, of birthing myself again Mm -hmm. uh, because that's ultimately what happens when you balance the masculine and feminine well. You're both the womb and the spade at once. You are both uh, journeys at once, and that's that's what we got to do at Arcadia when I was speaking there. Invited 900 people at once to experience both in themselves mm -hmm. and stop looking to their partner to you know be the feminine in their life or the masculine in their life. All of that energetics is is within the individual, and mm -hmm. it's such an exciting thing for us to be scratching the surface of forgiveness ultimately, which is where we began with your story, is that your superpower of forgiveness is, like I said, a fractal of where we must be as humanity. Because if we do not forgive that wounded masculine, the victim will become the perpetrator again. And you see this very often. Women who have been abused and, and victimized in horrific situations in either that generation's iteration or the next generation's iteration, they become perpetrators at a magnitude of violence and abuse that mm -hmm. was worse than they had experienced, you know? Mm -hmm. And so 
when we don't allow the healing to happen, we become a perpetuator of the problem. And so we are in this moment of needing a deep, I am sorry, and the beginning of a deep, you are forgiven. And when we start with ourselves in that journey, it's amazing how fast the healing, I mean, that's basically what you heard in that instance of a couple whispers of a few words is you suddenly had a reorientation of like, oh, forgiveness feels like such a nurturing female thing but what i what came through from your higher self through my mouth was this is actually a structure for your life mm -hmm. and you you kept forgiving in the same way but like you said you started having some sort of you were doing this when you were describing it which is a vector you suddenly had a vector of of action which is your masculine you know direction mm -hmm. to this feminine energy mm -hmm. of forgiveness Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, you began to embody your superpower in both the masculine and the feminine. Mm -hmm. There's so many, every time you sit speak, there's just light bulbs that are popping off left, right, and center. <laughs> and you are speaking directly into the main piece that's on my altar right now, which mm -hmm. is uh, healing my relationship with my own inner masculine and have gone into the feminine way of a deep level of listening to the earth, making offerings, sitting in front of my altar hours every day, being that which is needed. And also at the same time, dropping the ball a little bit, like not following through, dotting my eyes, crossing my T's in certain areas. And I've sort of let the masculine fall away a little bit. And I've been really deeply in the prayer of like, let's get to the root of this. And it's actually my relationship to the masculine within myself, my relationship to the masculine exhibited within my parents, my relationship to the masculine within society, through media, through food. I mean, just literally it's everywhere and as within, so without and vice versa. It goes infinitely in and infinitely out. And yet the only way to truly change the course of how I move forward is to detect how I'm responding to the inherent power that I have within myself as long as I can actually detect that it's even in my conscious awareness. It's in a blind spot. It's called a blind mm -hmm. spot for a reason. I can't see it. And so the fact that you're even speaking into this is the direction that the, co the conversation is wishing to go is also so ripe right now in my awareness. And so... Um, how would you then, for people that are listening, that are going, okay, cool, like I can actually create a new relationship with my inner masculine and my inner feminine. Um, how would you guide people into first detecting where there's an imbalance? Like how has the patriarchy or, or um, society infiltrated into our consciousness that has set up a program that is operating in our awareness that we don't even know is operating and yet we're seeing externally chaos or we're having to constantly put out fires and it's a byproduct of not really fully integrating both our masculine and our feminine to a place of wholeness mm. yeah so the the evidence of the imbalance is everywhere you know i think you can look at any moment in your life whether it be the way in which you just ordered your coffee at the coffee shop all the way to your last relationship all the way to the way in which your church runs <laughs> to the way in which your synagogue has forgotten itself to the way that medicine works like the evidence is literally in the fabric of society because the wounded masculine that has been exerting this pathologic you know imbalance on the system dates back towards the origins of man you know and all of our origin stories seem to include some version of the fall, you know? And so there was some sort of heaven on earth. There was some sort of state of nirvana of sense of connection to everything. And then suddenly that ended. And I'm curious to know, you know, what that moment was, but I've seen enough evidence in the, in the world of chemical interaction with neurology that I'm quite confident there simply could have been a chemical introduced to the human brain that suddenly divorced us from our divine state. Mm. And that could have been a fruit. And so we're told that there was some apple picked from a tree, blah, blah, blah. Uh, relatively modern interpretation of a garden because certainly apples didn't exist 200,000 years ago in any way, shape, or form to what they look like today. Um, but nonetheless it's actually not outside of the, the world of possibility that a plant was interacted with that actually created a neurologic lesion that separated us from the divine and now you see people all over the world engaging plant medicine to re-engage that relationship and so they can do it through cacao they can do it through mushrooms they can do it through you know a number of different vines and roots and all of these different things that are coming out of ancient wisdom traditions all over the world they can do with toad poison i mean like 
give me a break. Like how many ways is nature trying to reconnect this lesion? <laughs> Which means that nature prepared for this lesion, really. You know, nature was ready for this lesion to occur mm -hmm. and has prepared a, a myriad of tools out there to show us that we can self-repair this lesion. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, your plant medicine may last 15 minutes in the bloodstream, but you see people permanently transform their life because they came into a knowingness within themselves from their own endogenous medicine within themselves. Uh, and once you turn on receptors in your body, whether it be a pharmaceutical interaction or a plant medicine experience, whatever it is, once an avenue is started, it's way easier to turn that avenue on. And so I'm excited by people finding their way back into nature as a solution for our, our wounded masculine because it was our divorce from nature that began it. And so whatever it was, whether it was symbolic and we were born this way as a species or we actually were born whole and then we had this schism occur and maybe it was an emotional trauma rather than a, a neurochemical trauma, but there was a trauma that occurred that suddenly separated us. And for the feminine, it meant sudden suppression because the masculine felt like they weren't enough. And the masculine had a, perhaps a more physical presence of physical strength uh, to exert their will at, the, at that moment. And suddenly the female finds herself safer if subservient to a masculine that's trying to now be the divine and the nature and the everything to this person. And I certainly did that in my, my relationships over my lifetime. I, I was so trying to be the best husband, father, you know, community member, doctor, in every one of these, I was trying to become the whole, you know, I was trying to be everything to everybody. And I was trying to fix anything that was broken. Mm -hmm. And in that, I'm sure the experience for my spouse and partner of 20 years and everything else was probably something a lot like, wow, not here, you are just not here, you're always running around trying to fix everything mm -hmm. else. That, and you don't even know who you are. And so there was a vacancy there that was not a relate a result of the relationship. It was a result of me, <laughs> of my relationship to self, uh, expressing the wounded masculine. And so in my altruistic, good-hearted, I'm I'm an insanely happy, kind, innocent little brain. Like I just always crack myself up with just like my little goodness that runs around i'm like oh this is so cute zach did you even think that way because i think the rest of the world would be embarrassed for you if they knew what you were thinking right now because they're actually thinking something interesting and creative and sexy and wonderful and you're thinking that like it's so cute <laughs> so that's who i am on some level and yet you know i thought i had to go fix everybody else to prove i was worth anything and so the, the wounded masculine doesn't have to look toxic, doesn't have to look abusive, doesn't have to look, you know, narcissistic. The wounded masculine might be a really nice, sweet guy running around being like, hey, can I, you got a problem? I can fix that. I can be that for you, you know. <laughs> yeah, light bulbs out, I got that. <laughs> and, and I did it all. Like, I built cars. I built houses. I was a general contractor. Oh. So I could build a house for my wife. <laughs> then I was a gardener, so I could build a garden for my wife. Then, okay, we'll do kids, and then we'll do dogs. And we got this whole thing, and I fixed everything. Isn't your life perfect? It's not perfect. What's not perfect? That's not perfect. I can fix that. What do you need me to become? I could become something. I could become something completely different. Yeah, that's the freaking broken masculine right there. They're running around in a nice guy and it's freaking annoying and it's freaking <laughs> lonely for the person receiving all of that because they're like you don't know who i am you don't know who you are and you're just like a mr fix it and that's <laughs> not a relationship not a relationship <laughs> yeah and so this is why we've kind of pigeonholed oh the wounded masculine is donald trump or you know pick one of these public figures that clearly are some version of a broken egoic model of anger or something we all have a Donald Trump within us, every single one of us. <laughs> but we also have the really annoying person who thinks they're good but isn't, you know, it's like he it thinks they're good and knows all this but is good but isn't actually present so therefore isn't alive. And so we're all in some sort of numbed out version of ourselves mm. for this woundedness of trying to fix everything. Mm. And so, you know, everybody finds their path to the same thing. It's it's just, you know, every podcast you've probably ever done, every conversation anybody's had that felt meaningful is always the same story. It's like, I tried to do everything perfectly and then I f completely broke because I ran out of energy and I mm. completely ran myself into the wall or the ground. And then I had to surrender it 
And then as soon as I surrender it, things started getting better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's been my last, you know, 40 years of life or whatever. Um, I remember that, that year, when I was 10 years old, I definitely remember having those traits of trying to be more than I needed to or whatever, you know, trying to be good, you know, as the oldest son and all these things. So I tried to live the picture perfect life, not just for my immediate family, but I was the oldest kid in my whole church, which was a home church in Boulder, Colorado, a bunch of hippies that kind of became, you know, that weird journey of how hippies actually became Republicans and created strip malls and Walmart and everything else. Like it was a weird 50 years of journey of watching a society kind of do the opposite thing that they set out to do at the dawning of Aquarius. We went and created the New York stock exchange of today and all these weird opposites of what we had intended perhaps as a, as a peoples in the late sixties, as we started to think we were becoming awake, Mm. what went wrong? Like, how did we miss so, so hard? And I think it has to do with this failure to heal, um, this divine masculine. And so, uh, somewhere in there is this deep sense of we are not enough as men and as women expressing that same wounded masculine, we are not enough. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that line that had changed my life, hearing it from my patients in ICUs that I've shared on so many podcasts. But when you hear somebody come back from dead, literally, heart stops, you know, you run in, paddle them five times, pump all the meds, they're dead for 15 minutes suddenly pop back in the body and they're like, oh my God, why'd you bring me back? That was so Mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And this is so painful to Mm -hmm. be in this body right now. Why am I back? I want to be back there because I felt completely accepted. Mm -hmm. What? Like they tell you after death things are like, you'll see the light. No, you will feel Mm -hmm. completely accepted, which is to say you will be completely known. And so what are we really running around with? A lack of sense of being known, seen, heard, and all that. And why are we not being seen, heard, and everything else? Because the wounded masculine within each of us think we have to be everything to everybody and don't realize we're supposed to receive rather than make things right. Mm -hmm. So this is the journey of maybe a nice kid who set out to be the best Boy Scout, the best Christian, the best husband, the best dad. And on a long journey found out that I was just supposed to be a divine child of God and be receiving everything all the time, Mm -hmm. just as the lily of the field or the blooms on a cherry tree. These things don't have to, to wonder. Like this cherry tree has never woken up once wondering who it is, like or whether it's worthwhile or is it doing a good enough job? Mm-hmm. You know, you walk through the woods, not a single entity in there is confused about who they are or their worth to the system at large. Mm-hmm. Not a single entity, tree, earthworm or otherwise is waking up th- rethinking yesterday. Like, did I do that well? I mean, <laughs> like that other tree kind of acted like that when I my branch went like that and the other branch went like, am I, re- <laughs> did I offend that tree? Like, <laughs> This shit doesn't happen in nature yet. You know, the, the human thinking itself separate from nature, therefore thinking it ourselves separate from one another. Mm. We read in this whole narrative of separation, therefore scarcity, therefore so many problems to fix, which mm. is the perfect thing for the divine masculine that's become a wounded masculine to go try to fix everything that's mm-hmm. broken in a system that's separated from nature. So... That's the long journey, I think, of my medical career that has now taken me back into this, you know, intersection between planetary health and human health because you can't actually have the one without the other. You cannot have planetary health until humans reconcile themselves with nature because we will continue to destroy, extract, you know, do all of our stuff. And you cannot have human biology healthy if the planet beneath your feet is crumbling in its biology for your own actions and your own sense of separation. So mm-hmm. that's where I, I came full circle, I think, as a, as a doctor and as a scientist perhaps, was to start asking the deepest questions of root cause of human biology. And it took me right into the soil systems. Mm-hmm. And it was when we started to divorce ourselves from the nurture of nature and we started to create convenient food systems which started thousands of years ago and this isn't just in the last 50 years we started creating convenience food thousands of years ago as we scaled agriculture and this was you know the the death of north africa you know egypt the the modern egypt 5000 years ago 
and then even worse so 2,000 years ago with the Roman Empire coming into North Africa, that was the first large-scale devastation of nature that we did as we destroyed you know, North Africa. We created the largest desert out in the world out of the most verdant rainforest in the world. You couldn't walk from one, or you could walk from one side of North Africa to the other without seeing the sun because the tree canopy was so complete. Now you can walk one side to the other without seeing a single tree because it's the Sahara Desert. How did we do that so quickly? In just a couple hundred years, we created the biggest desert out of the biggest rainforest. It's because we, in our wounded state of scarcity, thought we needed to extract more than nature was willing to give in that moment. And when we th thought ourselves you know, in management of her instead of a, in receipt of her nature and nurture, we started this decimation of, of the earth. And uh, mm. so that's where we find ourselves today in the sixth grade extinction as we see life evaporating around us. We've had a 10,000-fold acceleration in species extinction over just 30 years. You know, the rates are insane now. It's like one species is thought to be going extinct every 20 minutes. And so in the course of this podcast, we'll lose, you know, four or six species to extinction probably some of which we have no idea what they were or why they were here or what kind of beauty they were here to express. And so we are annihilating life in our separation anxiety. And mm -hmm. here we are in a conversation mm -hmm. and I have deep joy inside of me. Mm -hmm. Where's that coming from? Mm -hmm. I look into your eyes and I see bright freaking light pouring through there. Mm -hmm. And I just have to wonder like, okay, here's the human narrative here's the finite perspective as we are the wounded masks and running around extracting destroying mother earth to the point of her sixth extinction mm -hmm. and yet these souls are lighting up and they are showing up faster than ever before we've got 7.8 billion souls showing up right now that's a pretty good experiment mm -hmm. what is what is the chess game actually going on here yeah mm -hmm. it's probably not just so we can extract and destroy earth faster if so we would all see the lights going out on humanity on every level. We certainly see biology going out, but we see shining through the dimness of our biology something much brighter than any mm -hmm. biologic system, which is a soul, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of infinite being. And I know this is weird to hear, not for your audience, but for my colleagues that sure as hell are not tuning in right now from the Western medicine world, but if they were to tune in and they hear me talking about, you know, souls and energy fields and all that, they, it's difficult. It's, there's just not the lexicon. They haven't been given that. I hadn't been given a structure to think about that or know that. But it wasn't until I was in hospice that I got to see from the Western medical paradigm the reality of souls leaving the body and coming back in. Because a body that is dead is inanimate. Like, you can feel it. It's just like, it's... There's no energy in it. And then suddenly on the fourth shock for no reason that's apparent, that heart suddenly starts going because that soul re-embodied right before that heart started again. The body re-established re connection to the energy field and therefore the heart started. It's not the other way around. It's not the heart started and eventually and the, the energy reconnected. Mm -hmm. That energy center, that energy field that organizes biology which all you physicians listening, go to protein folding in your textbook if you want to know that there's an energy field. Proteins fold in the most insane beauty with absolutely no template for what they're going to become, and yet they do it billions of times a second in the body. And these structures that these long strings of amino acids suddenly spontaneously fold into are so exquisite. I mean, it's, it's like imagining the Taj Mahal building itself in, in one millionth of a second... From, from with no hands involved. Every stone just going poof, right into its space. That happens billions of times a second in the human body perfectly. And so we are springing these three-dimensional realities out of absolutely freaking nothing in the biologic realm. So where are they coming from? And the first law of thermodynamics is so beautiful. It says you can never destroy or create energy. It can only be transformed in its nature or its expression. And so a protein suddenly popping into the Taj Mahal to be glutathione or, you know, any other incredible enzyme structure or protein structures, these structural proteins called gap junctions, these are fiber optic cables that run from one cell to the next. You're talking about a structure, the whole cable is about, let's see, it'd be about a tenth the size of the circumference of a human hair. So... Cut that human hair 10 times, and now you're looking at the, the whole fiber optic cable. 
But then you zoom in with an electron microscope and find out there's 1,000 hollow cables in that little structure. <laughs> and at the end of every one of those, that's now 10,000 times smaller than a human hair, there is a perfect camera aperture, just like the camera aperture that allows light into your camera lens, there's a perfect aperture built and functioning in its three-dimensionality on the end of one of every one of those tubes that's 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. That shit's happening spontaneously in a single cell to become a multicellular organism. And that infant emerging from the womb of that woman has 70 trillion human cells that actually have no ability to create light energy, therefore has no ability to be alive. So nature plans for 200 mitochondria, which are bacteria, to live inside of every human cell to liberate the light energy out of food so that that cell could be animated. And so you actually have 14 quadrillion bacteria born into this, this being that hasn't even taken its first breath yet. And that 14 quadrillion bacteria is so pack every single cell so full that if we were to draw a human cell correctly, you wouldn't see anything but mitochondria. So you go to a biology textbook, there's two mitochondria floating in there and like, these are the mitochondria and they're human organelles. They're not human, they're bacteria. And there's 200 per cell, unless of course it's a nerve, in which case there's 2000 mitochondria packed into the cell body of that nerve. You've got 14 quadrillion bacteria in an organic garden living within this child that has just emerged to take its first breath. And that was self-organizing. <laughs> so is there a soul or is there an energy field? Sure as hell is there because it happens again and again and again. And those babies keep coming out with 10 toes, 10 fingers. And you got to wonder how is that freaking possible? We don't know how it's possible, really, but I can tell you it happens every day, and that is proof that there is a soul. <laughs> well, if I haven't ever landed more in my body <laughs> through a description of my life, now is the moment. <laughs> I am like, Welcome home. <laughs> fully incorporated in this quantum computer of mass capacity and miracles, and just through that segment alone is enough to breathe life into the remembrance of the miracle of what it truly means to be alive. And it's where beauty and destruction sit side by side of the human experience is, is to see what is truly happening on the planet while also in the same breath receiving the miracle of what it means to be here. And it is breathing life into sev all 70 trillion cells of my body mm. just through the balance of your relationship with spirit and science and how they merge beautifully hand in hand. They're not against each other, but they are actually part of the same team. And when worked together, they create a wholeness, almost like the pineal gland sits right in between the left and the right lobes of the brain. And so when we're balancing the masculine and feminine principles, we're actually creating and activating the pineal gland in its fullness of expression and therefore ability to see beyond the veil. And so through what you're expressing, I'm being able to see through the veil because you're partnering the masculine and the feminine principles, the spirit and the science going hand in hand through your education and your relationship to spirit and your deep level of listening is allowing me to activate into a deeper understanding of self, the mystery of what it means to be human and the responsibility of what it means to move from this point forward with the miracle that I've been given. And that is why we all listen to your podcast. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Well said. That is beautiful. And you are beautiful in the way in which you're receiving that information and immediately embodying not just yourself, but the information itself. And you're allowing that information to change your molecular structure. Mm -hmm. And this has now been proven in a whole field of science called epigenetics that the environment and the information flowing towards us immediately changes our genetics. Mm -hmm. And that's a great promise because we need to rebirth a new genetics for humanity. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, there's some really cool, you know, ancient prophecies that are saying that, you know what, in this decade that humans sit within mm -hmm. is the end of one epoch and the birth of the next. Mm -hmm. So some say it's 50,000 year epoch, some say it was a 100,000 year epoch. It was a long one. And it's wrapping up, it wrapped up a few years ago, and we're now in this metamorphic stage before the next really emerges. And so we're in a 10 year period or so, where we are in that cocoon cocoon of the caterpillar where the caterpillar has fully dissolved now mm. but the butterfly is not there yet we're kind of in that mush we stage. are in the mush stage <laughs> and so please write enormous permission slip to yourself tonight as you go to sleep of like all of your disappointments today all of your poor actions or words 
just recall that you are a caterpillar that's lost all of its structure and you're just a pile of mush Mm -hmm. in a cocoon waiting to find your own beauty and express something that you can't even imagine at this stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so write each of us, you know, the permission slip to self and then let's start writing each other permission slips. Like, you didn't dot your T's and I's, well, you know what, you're just a pile of freaking protoplasm at the moment, so you're doing pretty good, you know. And so this is the the journey we're on now is to forgive ourselves in this rebirth moment. You know, can we imagine the infant being squeezed down, you know, the, the birth canal suddenly being like, I am a complete failure. <laughs> I can't move anything. I can't move my arm. I can't move my leg. All I can feel is pain and pressure. I feel like I'm suffocating. <laughs> I am worthless. I am a freaking just log being pressed into nothing. I, why is spirit even paying attention to me right now? I am worthless. Mm. And then a couple of seconds later, it pops out of the vaginal canal and takes its first breath and sees something more beautiful than it could have ever imagined within the womb. And so we just have to recognize our position right now. Like it should be a mess. Like we look at politics, oh, we, we shouldn't even be here as humans. We're just such idiots. No, we're just like mush right now. We've lo- we've had to let go of everything so we can become something much more beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so let's give each other deep, deep grace, deep, deep forgiveness mm-hmm. as we keep talking about it. I think it's beautiful that subject keeps coming up in this podcast. Like it has to be forgiveness at the foundation of all this and it has to begin with forgiveness of self. Mm-hmm. And so forgive you yourself, your broken relationships if you want to perceive them that way. Where I'm getting to in my own life is every relationship I think through, they were absolutely freaking crystalline, perfect, beautiful. And they were designed by our higher selves to take us into a more tight relationship with our divine self rather than to complete ourselves in some other person or other entity or other company or whatever it was. These We created these situations so that we would surrender the belief that we were complete. Because we have to come to the the realization that we have been living an incomplete life through the schism of the ego that got called in because of the broken state of the masculine and ego became our great protector. And so why even say anything bad about the ego? It was a great, a a brilliant genius method for surviving a couple hundred thousand years of brokenness, you know. And here we are, we're still surviving. There's more of us on the planet than any time in human history all combined. Add up every human's ever been born on the earth they're all going to be here right now so we're all here again and it means that we know that there's something possible that's so far beyond our previous experience and so we showed up again Mm -hmm. so here we are we're playing the game but when i'm watching you digest that information and you just lit up it reminds us to ask the question to what end because it's it's cool to find out that we're infinite beings light beings that are having a finite experience that we call human life Mm -hmm. it's pretty cool science is really cool the the images are truly amazing for all of the beauty that we see out through these new space telescopes that are showing us you know so so far beyond the detail that the hubble provided us for all of that beauty you can see the same thing in our in my lab today I, i still have a basic science lab and now our basic science lab gets to ask questions and see beauty that i could not have even imagined asking in the university 12 years ago the equipment we have in, in my private laboratory is so far beyond the capacity of where my university lab was at. The questions I can ask about cancer cells or human gut cells or kidney cells or whatever we pick in the day, like the speed at which we get these exquisite answers back is just dumbfounding. And so we are here as a species developing the technologies to be witness to the beauty within us. Mm-hmm. And we have developed technologies to witness the beauty of the cosmos in which we occur. And so we sit as a witness to both. And I think that's why we're here. To what end do we animate a billion proteins a second? To what end do 14 quadrillion mitochondria power me into a light state to heal again today so that I would be present with you? To what end so that I would be a more alert witness to the beauty? Mm -hmm. And that's it. And if we start actually leaning into the beauty, the speed at which we are all going to fall in love with each other is going to be unprecedented. And the depth of that feeling is going to be so foreign to us and so transformative. It it will transmute all pain, guilt, suffering, shame, fear into pure joy instantly. It is a transmutive power within us to be witness to beauty. That's, That's our magic. 
That's why we were given five senses. That's why we've been gifted to be able to collect the, the information from our gut and the incredible intelligence of the, the ecosystems within us to manifest a single neurologic experience of a human life. Most of the information we get that we form ideas out of come from no human cells. They all come from bacteria and fungi and protozoa inside of our guts. And so our, our ecosystem, our organic garden is creating the information by which we could be a creative force. Whoa, <laughs> this is so cool. Like, what is this about? This is literally about the fact that we are starting to come to terms with who we are, what we are, and why we're here. And... I just am so excited to be leaning into love so much deeper in my life and take it out of its box. I was told it had to stay in these safe boxes of, you know, you're the oldest son and you're the good Christian and keep, you know, I know you love Jesus. Just stay in that, that box because you know, mm. there's other gods out there. You don't want to love them, you know. <laughs> Stay, keep that love contained. Oh, you love somebody, well, you should get married and keep that thing and tight in that box and make sure you don't love anybody else because that'd be terrible, you know? Mm. And so as I go through the history of my relationships and think of the, the hard left turns my partners made into love in other places, here I was thinking I was getting left behind and I'm just so excited now that they found another channel of love. Like, oh my gosh. And that's how I feel towards my kids, my adult kids now in their 20s and... My son just got married and they've been with his partner for eight years, an amazing uh, daughter-in-law now. And watching these journeys of my children, I just keep reminding them, just like, just take it out of the box all the time. Just get the walls mm -hmm. off that love and just do it messy, bigger, whatever. Just keep getting it bigger because the second you put it in a box, it's going to start to die because love is not a thing. It is a vibration of being witness to beauty. Let me repeat that. Love is the experience of being witness to beauty. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you put a bird in a cage, it loses its life. You know, mm -hmm. It's just, it cannot be caged. So do not cage the beauty around you and you will stay in love. But you're going to have to believe that love is abundant because <laughs> the moment you feel it and you stay in your scarcity mentality, you're going to want to grab it. You're going to want to cage it up. Make sure you don't lose it. And so we create constructs and we slip rings on each other's fingers and we do all kinds of things to say, you promise you don't leave me. You promise this is love forever, right? And then you wonder a few years later why you don't even know the person you're supposed to be loving and why you don't feel seen or understood by this person that's vowed their life to you. You cage the bird. You cage the beauty. And the lights start to go out because the experience of seeing beauty gets harder and harder as you put more and more walls on that cage. And pretty soon you're not showing the beauty to anybody. And that's, that's how everybody has fallen out of love with me in, mm -hmm. in times of, of my life of effort is there was nothing left to love because I had so covered up my beauty with all of the walls and beliefs and everything else and I had so caged myself in and nobody could see my beauty. So there was no love to be felt. Mm. And now every morning when I wake up on my pillow alone or whatever situation and I find myself staying in a lot of guest houses these days because I travel all over the world and I get so tired of hotels. And somebody's like, oh, you just stay with us. And now I'm just like, yes, I will stay anywhere. <laughs> on a couch, on whatever. <laughs> and so I often am now waking up to the sound of somebody else's children, which is totally glorious because the sound of children is like the most wonderful thing, unless they're your children, in which case you suddenly start running this long list of broken masculine things that you have to do for those kids and everything else. So it's wonderful to hear the joy and innocence of a child's voice in the morning as they wake up in their magic and they're amazed by the world and then chuckle as you hear the parents start running around and diminishing the light of the whole household. What do you want for lunch? What are you going to wear? Put those shoes on. <laughs> oh my gosh. We're, we're putting life into, into the bird cage. You know, all of life. We put our children into these bird cages so that they will finally get to the kindergarten so that we can actually have eight hours to actually go do our job. You know, whatever it is, you know, we have all these constructs and so we're throwing each other in cages and oh my gosh, my parents... 72 and has dementia and I, you know, better go put that in a box because I don't have time or bandwidth to deal with that. And so the world's like, no problem. We'll build boxes and cages for everything. And so then we get to the end of life and be like, that was it. Mm -hmm. that, that, what happened? And yeah, I don't hear depression at the end of life. Hospice, thousands of patients. I was admitting 80 patients a week that were dying when I was a hospice director. And when you see that much death, 
you would think you would hear a lot of people dismally depressed about their life, and it was so often the opposite. You know, and certainly it can occur that way, but it's definitely the the slim minority of cases. The vast majority of people, as they reach the veil, start to look back with a sense of that levity and laughter of the wise one that just says, oh, my gosh, I took myself so freaking seriously. And <laughs> all that happened is the wind blew, and my arm went there and hit the other tree, and then that... It was this whole trigger of events, and I thought it was, it, we were just all trees in the forest singing a song together. We were all dancing, and we bumped into each other a couple of times, and we took offense. Like it, it, you just get this totally different perspective on life in those last few breaths of life. And so my eagerness for this next expression of humanity is we learn how to die every single day so that we can be more alive tomorrow without having to wait till the biologic death to see the beauty of everything, you know, and... So my, my passion right now is, you know, to begin every morning with a sense of I am the storm. I, I am a creative force that, that wants to bring so much water into the system. And we've just been through a couple of crazy days of weather here in Southern California where it never rains. And it's been raining for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then it just got out of craziness over the last couple of days. And I was up in Topanga Canyon with my team. We were think tank for the future. And mudslides are everywhere and the power's out and everything's going and you walk out and life is going berserk in Topanga Canyon. Like I've been there many, many times and it is a brown wasteland. You can't believe people actually want to live there because it's just dust and dried out. And it looks like Northern Ireland or something right now. It is so green. Like I walked out with my team last night. The sun finally came out after a few days right at sunset and we walked out and it was like our eyes hurt from the amount of green we were seeing. Like... It was so overwhelming. And I've been in that exact spot at Commune. And thank you, Jeff Krasno, Skyler, for what you guys are doing for building community. I have seen that view so many times and it has never been slightly green. And it was so overwhelmingly green last night as the sun set. It was just a reminder that beneath all of that dead soil is a billion seeds waiting to express life so much more vibrantly than we can possibly imagine. And so in this desolate time of your heart, perhaps, or this desolate time of your spirit, or this sense of complete exhaustion and fatigue, just remember the rain takes a few drops to ignite all of those seeds that are sitting within your mm -hmm. seed bank. And when that lights up, my gosh, it's going to look like freaking Hobbit Shire or something around you. I mean, mm -hmm. all plump and happy, running around smoking tobacco and doing mm -hmm. your drinking beer at night and carrying on late into the night with celebration and fireworks and everything else because, damn, we're all alive and it's beautiful. And it's so effervescent. It's here and then it's gone. So we better remember why we showed up, which was to taste of the universe through a finite five senses because you can't actually taste coffee when you're a, a, an, an angelic being disconnected from body. You can't taste the coffee. <laughs> you can't, you know, I don't even like coffee and I, or I, I grieve that anyways. I'm like, oh my God, all those people loving their coffee so much. I'm so happy for them. <laughs> they, 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 they can taste it for eons and now they're in a body and they're tasting their freaking coffee this morning again. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's, That's so fantastic. cute. Like, it's just so cute. Look at how much. Oh, they're so grumpy until they get their first cup of coffee. That's so funny. <laughs> My God, of course they're grumpy. Like, their soul that took all that eon's journey to taste the coffee, and they haven't gotten their coffee yet. The kid won't put his shoes on, and of course they're grumpy at the kid because they got to taste the coffee. And so we have to just chuckle at this life journey of it is finite and it's supposed to be finite so that we can see the beauty so that we can experience love so we can experience this this universe in a whole new way as vibrational beings that are expressing this this experience of love when we see all the beauty when you're delivering the words i am getting mental images of how i live my life <laughs> and i'm being gifted the permission to enjoy even more absorb the richness be the richness see the beauty and to allow the lenses to be cleared off to actually realize like like when i came out of my darkness retreat because i had literally died in the earth <laughs> like four days and four nights of just pitch black in the middle of the earth uh, or like in the ground and when i came out the sun hitting my face was this m like miraculous giant ball of fire in the sky <laughs> that is sending warmth to my cheek as the wind blows and the wind is the ancestors communicating through the communicating through the winds and the clouds and then 
in comes a bird. <laughs> it's like this tiny quantum computer that <laughs> yeah. flies through the sky with like the most meticulous wi- like feathers in the wings. And just through the rebirth of being able to see life like a newborn baby in a 32-year-old body and witnessing the the majesty of what it truly means to be alive and um, the way that your words are delivering me back into that place is reminding me the power of storytelling and reminding mm. me the power of media as medicine and just being able to have these conversations like you said at the beginning of the podcast saying like, we used to do this our ancestors used to do this we'd sit down and we'd have a cup of tea or we'd sit with our sacred fire and, and our sacred smokes and we would share stories and illuminate different neural pathways without even having to have lived it myself but just through your stories and your words I can actually go to those places within my own consciousness and that's ultimately the intention of this podcast is that maybe you're not going to go to a darkness retreat however you can tune into the podcast and receive the codes and the gifts of what that even can feel like and look like and on the topic of coffee Mm. i i wanted to ask you this is a perfect segue actually um for for for, i'd say 30 yeah 32 years of my life i never drank coffee it was just never something Mm. that i gravitated towards but over the last year I have become oh. quite the coffee fan. Oh, very good. <laughs> I'm fresh, I'm new on the journey, and I totally get what the hype <laughs> is about. And I wake up in the morning, and I kind of, like, pull myself out, like, golem out of my bedroom, and then I, like, go, pour my cup of coffee, and I'm a different person. I actually want to respond to my emails. And then I realized, no one ever taught me this, but there is also a path of over-committing while on your first cup of coffee <laughs> yeah. and realizing that the coffee actually wears off. And so I was even thinking make a memoir of over committing on coffee a memoir by blue because no one actually talks about this spike and then this crash and then be like oh i've actually got to do the things that i said that i would do when i was on my first cup of coffee um i would like to know from a scientific perspective because there's a world of misinformation and also um sweet paradoxes out in the world around things that are actually healthy for our microbiome um and coffee being a very hot topic Uh, what's your relationship with coffee and do you believe that it it can actually be utilized in a way that can support us in our life or do you think that it's actually because somebody said once to me when you drink a cup of coffee you're borrowing tomorrow's energy Mm -hmm. yeah i think there's there's some biologic truth to anything that gives a neurologic rush as a danger for the body you know so there's definitely you know whether it be sugar or fat salt sugar combinations or caffeine or you know it's something in that bitterness and umami and all that of the coffee that that creates these neurologic experiences in addition to the caffeine so it's not just the caffeine that's doing that the the high that you're experiencing there that gets you so excited to overcommit it's it's really you know anything that we interact with when we are not in a healed state can become pathologic you know and, and so this is where the codependence to coffee or your morning routine whatever it is and people are addicted to much as much as they are their coffee or whatever it is. So like whatever routine you're in, that becomes the solace to your broken state mm. and therefore palliates you from not changing that broken state. Yeah, it's going to shorten your life. No question. Mm. It's also going to diminish your awareness of life in, in a lot of ways. And that's where I get concerned about, you know, patterns of behavior of any type. You know, I think that... Uh, people can be in a pathologic relationship to their toothbrush. Like, well, I brushed my teeth and so now I'm going to lay down at peace because I brushed my teeth. If you're sitting there falling asleep because you feel like you checked that last box and therefore you're at peace, probably not at peace. <laughs> like, It's like, no, actually you are a turmoil of stress because your soul knows you're here for a different reason than you're acting or you're putting all your effort towards and your energy field is trying to go a certain direction and the world is telling you to go the opposite and you keep listening to the world. And for that, the tension between your your energetic state of being and your biologic behavior gets further and further separated. And the result of that is generalized anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, chronic, chronic everything, autoimmune disease ultimately. Mm. And so anything that we reach for that is palliating and making us okay in living separate from our our real path or continuing to uh, uh, tolerate the pain of of that separation from self uh, is a problem Uh, from a biologic standpoint it's a problem but is that a bad thing like no i think we had to do the two hundred thousand year journey into our complete extinction awareness so that we could go do something different and so 
there is nothing wrong with anything. Like it's all, that's, that's the big secret to this new metamorphosis of humanity is we need to stop judgment on everything. <laughs> like, you know, if you, if you let go of judgment, suddenly everything becomes incredibly easy, mm -hmm. incredibly easy. And so we, we can't judge the coffee for being bad because, you know, you're t taking life from tomorrow. That's a scarcity mentality of life right there, by the way. And we do this in biology all the time. And biohackers are classic for this. Like, oh, my gosh, I looked at my aura ring data this morning. I only have five and a half hours of sleep. And I crunched the numbers. And I'm pretty sure I lost 45 minutes of my life expectancy. Like, it's like <laughs> so ludicrous. Well, you actually just spent 45 minutes figuring out. So, yes, you did lose 45 minutes of your life. But it actually had nothing to do with your five and a half hours of sleep. It had to do with your mental construct of where life comes from, which is actually not your aura ring data. And so, yeah, it's like... The, this is where our pathology is landing is like we're, we're overthinking the very state of being alive and we've <laughs> diminished it to these series of metrics that may or may not have any relevance. I mean, you meet my great grandmother. She's passed away now at 102. That woman had no clue what blood sugar she should have, what blood pressure she should have. She had no idea what REM sleep was. She had no idea that canned food was bad for her. She grew, she was born in 1901. Like she just lived life and she was so full of joy. Mm -hmm. And she told more sex jokes than anybody else in my family. <laughs> and she just was so hilarious with her, her sweet raunchy, sweet version of raunchy or whatever she was doing in her head that just kept everybody cracking up her whole life. And she would get so angry if anybody acted like she was old, not to mention you couldn't say she was old or needed to be cared for. She didn't even want you to hint at it by your behavior. You try to open a door for you. Like, what are you doing? I got the door. Like, Just like all over it and just a zeal for life. She, she wore high heels until she died. And then she died because she stopped wearing high heels. She loves this about her life. This is my great-grandmother's favorite thing is she died of sneakers. And she was trying to insist on that being written on her death certificate because finally she, she calls up my cousin who's a money manager and she's 96 at the time or something like this. This is like 1998 or something like that. She's like... Yeah, you know, Jamie, I want to I wanna sell my house. She's living alone in Frederick, Maryland, thriving in the same house that she lived in for 60 years. Her husband passed away from a heart attack at 55, which always makes life longer for women. As soon as their husband passes away, they live like 30 years longer than expected. And so that's the, the, the broken masculine tries to cover up this data all the time. But that's the reality of it. See, her husband passes away. She's destined for a great long life. And so she lives single for the last 50 years of her life or whatnot. And in that journey, she's, you know, accumulated all this equity in her house so she calls up my cousin and is like i want to sell my house and he's like grandma i think that's so great we've been hoping that you'd like find a retirement community or independent living situation he's like, what the hell are you talking about and he's like well we just thought you could use more support she's like i don't need any support i want to sell my house because i want to invest in the stock market <laughs> and so, this woman at 96 and so then my cousin is like you know grandma like Actually, at 96, like the stock market's probably not going to yield much for you. Like, I don't know. She's like, I'm telling you, I think it's a good place to put my money. My house is not going to grow much over the next few years. I want to put, all right, Grandma. She sells her house, 1998, puts it in the stock market. 1998 to 2001 was the fastest explosion <laughs> of wealth on this planet in the NASDAQ, where she put all her money, which was short term stock, which was the, totally the wrong place to put your money in, explodes her wealth. And then calls up and is like, yeah, summer of 2001, I think you sell everything, sell everything, just put it in. 9 11 happens. I mean, the woman was the smartest investor on the planet, you know, and, and yet she never cared about anything that we're caring about. She didn't actually care how much money she had. She, would, she wanted to do that so that she made sure all of her grandkids would have something. She thought that was cute, you know, like, that'd be nice. <laughs> So, like, what the heck are we doing as anybody? If that's a life well lived and she doesn't even know what her fasting glucose level is, like, where are we going with biohacking? To what end are you trying to be alive, I guess mm -hmm. is the point. Mm -hmm. And what we felt a few minutes ago when I heard you integrating the information about how beautiful the fiber optic cables that run from one cell to the next passes the light energy being released by mitochondria inside your cells so that you would glow like a sun, actually 10,000 times brighter than the sun. I saw you integrating that information and I saw you stepping into a beauty and a power and a light that is not 
measured by any biometrics of anybody's biohacking protocol. You just became alive. And I fell in love with you again at that moment of like, my God, Blue, you are on fire. You're just doing it. And my gosh, if the world could all fall in love with each other just like that every minute that we look into each other's eye and be like, remember, we're freaking alive. Remember how miraculous this is? It's stupidly hilarious that we're alive right now. Like, give me a break. Let's go drink some coffee together and let's go just like <laughs> savor it. And I know it makes me sick to the stomach. I never will drink coffee. But I'll drink some tea maybe or I'm so into the coffee thing right now. Maybe I'll go ahead and try to drink a cup of coffee with you <laughs> just so that I can be like, oh, my gosh, those coffee beans carrying all that fungus and all that biocidal stuff. And it's such a terror at the biology level. And yet if we have enough pleasure in it, it will surpass all that and we'll live longer for it because the pleasure always trumps the, the trauma. And so this is how we live forever as we find so much pleasure in life that there is no trauma that can't be healed. And so, no, nothing can hurt you when you're in pleasure. Nothing can hurt you when you're lit up and you're living life and there's nothing you're doing wrong, nothing anybody's doing wrong with their biology if they're living present because being present is so exquisitely beautiful and you just are so wired for sound at that moment. You can heal anything. And we get to see this in our laboratory. The, we've studied extensively the ability of the, of the microbiomes communication network, the wireless communication between bacteria and fungi. When you put that onto human cells, they freaking light up. They sing so loud a beauty that you can't imagine. And in Petri dishes, we see human cells building human tissue, three-dimensional structures, like everything that's not supposed to be able to happen in a, a Petri dish happens in a Petri dish when you simply reintroduce that sterile human cell to its ecosystem of beauty. And suddenly it's like, ah, I know who I am. I know what I can create out of this Petri dish. I will build a liver. I will build a kidney. And so the, like the cells are so exuberant being a kidney cell that they start building new stuff. You see stem cells appear literally out of nowhere. Stem cells start doing things and you got new kidney cells and Petri dishes that nobody's ever seen this stuff before because we've always studied human biology and sterility. <laughs> and so our lab is the first to learn how to start to study the, the human cellular system within the context of the intelligence and the, the communication of the entire microbiome. And when you do that, you see life spring forward, spring up, spring out, spring blooming, just blooming everywhere. Which is to say that if you and I will go and reintegrate into the soil systems of our earth and start to breathe it and taste it and touch it, man, just coming in your, your place this afternoon, the smell on this earth right now after weeks and weeks of rain and then that sun comes out, mm. the smell of humus, that top layer of soil that is so full of life springing forth with new seeds and all the green grass blades, but also the fungi just in heaven right now. And they are humming underneath your feet. And you can feel this potential energy in the air you're breathing because it's actually the expiration of life. It's, it's the respiratory cycle of life. As she breathes out, I get to breathe in. And what I feel in that moment is so much life, so much vigor, so much beauty. And so a breath walking in here was just an ecstatic state. And then your beautiful colleague Rachel comes in and just gives me this giant hug and it's just like, all right, I'm ready to go. I, I've experienced the entire human journey right here in the last three minutes. I'm ready to die again. So fucking good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. And then you walked around the corner and I got another hug and it got even better. And so it's like, my God, how good does this get? How good is this going to get when we all realize that it's here for our receiving rather than our doing? <laughs> well, when you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, both Rachel and I are now like, <laughs> uh, we're also in the same breath. We can be on our cell phones missing all of this like walking past and being distracted from and disconnected from all of this. And so there's almost like a, there's um, two worlds happening simultaneously. And it's all about the greatest currency that we ever have, which is our attention. And where is our attention going and how are we receiving the miraculous breath that is right in front of us or the hug and being able to be activated in someone's inner joy and fire while being able to embrace in them and take a breath together and actually allowing ourselves in the deeper level of listening and sensitivity to receive the miraculous nature of what's all around us. And so that's ultimately the responsibility because the way that you're sharing is from uh, lenses 
that have been cleaned off enough to be able to receive that it's already here. And we're constantly talking about bringing heaven to earth. Heaven's already here. This is it. And it's ultimately through the lens in which we see life through. And there's 8 billion people almost on this planet. And there's 8 billion different realities happening simultaneously. And so for somebody that could have walked in and just been on their phone and been distracted and then walked in and got a hug and come in here and be like, gosh, we got to the next thing. Or also within three minutes, heaven on earth actually arrived and you're allowed to receive what has always been and will always be around us, um, hopefully. And uh, being able to then bring that as your offering, as your contribution to allowing heaven on earth to be a default for everybody on this planet, not just for your own experience. And yet you're being able to exhibit what it truly means to live a life from heaven on earth from the inside out. And that's the most sustainable model that exists because mm. it gets to live with us for the rest of our life. Whether we're standing in line at TSA or we are around people that we deeply love, recognizing that there's a gift in every eye contact, in every conversation, in every passing experience no matter how our mind deems it and mm. placing an emphasis on what you're talking about around the self-judgment and how that is infiltrated into the spiritual experience of biohacking or being the best version of ourselves, saying that we are not already the best versions of ourselves as it is in this breath, in this moment, just the way we are with just the environment that we are we find ourselves in. Mm. And so there is such a huge piece that you, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure your grandmother is now my new spirit animal because she is <laughs> Fabulous. She's fabulous. I didn't actually finish the story. She sold her house and went to this retirement facility. By the way, awesome monologue right there. Record, get that sound bite. Do that one on post. <laughs> Rachel, now I'm going to knock that out of the park because that was so good. But she, she should be her spirit animal because she reminded me a bit of her because she was totally, finally told in this, as soon as she moved into this facility, she became the head of the welcoming committee for new, new people moving to this community. So she's like social butterfly to beat all social butterflies. And, you know, she hits 101. And um, finally, they're like, you know, you can't wear high heels to the gym. <laughs> and she's like, but I, I mean, I don't, I want to do the exercise class, but I don't, this is the only kind of shoes I wear. <laughs> she had these sexy calves at, at 101, like defined calves at 100. Like you can't even believe this woman. Like she was ridiculous. And, and they're like, finally talk her into this. And so her daughter, my grandmother goes and buys her the her first pair of great sneakers. First day in the gym with her sneakers. She's never walked around in sneakers slips you know twists her foot a little bit just wrong breaks her hip dies two weeks later from this you know broken hip complications she thought it was hilarious she was like you guys have to make sure that my death certificate says i died of sneakers <laughs> like this is the most hilarious way to go she's and she lay in there like kind of half delirious in her hospital bed at 100 and i was up there sitting there at her bedside listening to her just crack jokes about her sneaker death and it was just so surreal. I was like, how is this woman never going to have a negative thought in her life? <laughs> she thinks this is freaking hilarious that she's dying. And it's of sneakers. Like, you know, she's, she's going off like, oh, you remember her? She died of breast cancer. I died of sneakers. Laugh again. <laughs> you know, just like, my God, this woman, like, who is this being that comes in with this much light and this much joy, you know? And so, yes, yeah, spirit animal for all of us was Mamie Ferguson. We called her nanny. She's phenomenal, phenomenal force of nature. Mm -hmm. But what you just said was so beautiful, and I'm moved that we're able to integrate this information so fast, right? Mm -hmm. like something comes through, and it's so beautiful, and it's so pure, and then suddenly it just crystallizes in the other person, mm -hmm. and they say something even more profound and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we do it, is so it all gets more beautiful. Because if you will tune in for a moment, listen to your deepest truth and speak it, you're going to trigger truth all around you. And it is beautiful to behold truth. And it is always so simple and it's so exquisite in its sacred geometry. When you were speaking there about, you know, the, this, you know, walking around the world and, you know, TSA lines and everything else, and we forget to be grateful, we forget the beauty of that moment. It reminded us of Wendell Berry poem. Wendell Berry is just got to speak with him on the, on the phone recently. It was just so exquisite and uh, it was years back now, I guess, but it felt like <laughs> like tomorrow, yesterday still for in my mind when I think of that voice. Um, but 
this this poet captured this the biology of the planet and humanity in the in the essence of spirit and love so exquisitely. But one of my favorite lines he wrote is then, "Until we realize that all places are sacred, we will only know desecrated spaces." And and so this is really important for mm-hmm. us as humanity right now, not only to realize the beauty of standing in a TSA line, but also to re- realize that the the dirt beneath your feet when you walk out of your front doors as sacred as the national park you're going to go to next year or Italy that you're going to fly off to or whatever beautiful place that you're trying to escape to it's right in front of you it's right under your feet and you're you if you're waiting for your vacation to start living beauty you're going to miss 99 percent of life and what made Mamie Ferguson definitely live to 101 was she thought everything was beautiful and she thought everything was hilarious and she saw the humor in everything and she loved show tunes, and I think that really kept her alive too. She sang all the time, and if we will go through this more, and this came through one of my big meditations at the beginning of last year. Sometimes when you're just silent, that's I should point that out. What what does the divine masculine look like in contrast to the running around nice dude trying to fix everybody? The divine masculine within me and you is still. And so when we come into stillness, we are expressing the divine masculine, which holds space-time, literally. That's, that's the atomic structure of what we've come to call the, the masculine energy. Masculine has gender qualities to it and everything else that screw up our concept of it. Literally, all it is is a matrix of space. And then through that space-time continuum, you can pour the feminine archetype, which is pure energy, and it's always in a nonlinear flow state for the way in which it interacts with a completely linear structure of the, the, the masculine field. Mm-hmm. And so to come into my divine masculine, all I have to do is hold super still at the cellular level, remind myself that I am, I am the structure of everything. Mm-hmm. And then I can let the universe flow through me. And in that moment, I become so beautiful to the person next to me. They can't even believe what's going on in their own body because all they can feel is the beauty of themselves. And they, they don't have to be distracted by my insecurities or my rushing around to try to heal my woundedness or whatever and ask them to be in some sort of box relationship so that I can heal myself in that box. Instead, just be still. And the beauty that flows through that space is... I'm so simultaneously grateful for how young I experienced it and how old I was. You know, how did I spend nearly half a century before feeling this? You know, how did it take me so long? I saw so many people die. I saw so many relatives die. I saw so many patients die. I listened to so many end of life stories. I and yet I still didn't get it. It has taken a long winding journey to get to the stillness to see all the beauty that's within me. And uh, I was just blown away the other day. I was in Park City, Utah. Two of my dearest friends, Patrick and Lori, amazing human beings. And they've seen me through 10 years of closings of chapters, openings of chapters, closings of those chapters. Like they've seen me through so many ups, downs, sideways. And they've loved me so thoroughly through the journey. They're always so curious about my life and the curiosity we all share together in knowing what the other is thinking. It's an exquisite friendship. And Park City had just gotten four feet of snow in like 10 days. And the temperature hasn't been above zero in quite some time there, above freezing. And so these icicles that were hanging off the top of their roof were just beyond 10, 15 feet in height. The, the ice schools as a whole, like frozen waterfall, probably five, six feet in, in diameter, this waterfall of, of icicles, and each one maybe six, four to six inches in diameter. And I stood in front of that and watched the sun come up you know, over a mountain ridge and pour through that frozen waterfall, and it was dazzling, insane beauty. Like the numbers of... If you just held still long enough, you could start to see a million rainbows per cubic millimeter. I mean, it was just like fractals and fractals and fractals and fractals of rainbows as the sun was refracting through still water. And I was struck by the fact that water is so gifted in its capacity to take on these different phases. And there's almost nothing more beautiful than watching a river race by your feet until you see it hold still for a moment. Mm. 
and then you see the million rainbows per cubic millimeter. And so in this way, I think it won't be until we heal the, the masculine that's running around within each of us into its full st static still state that we will realize our own beauty fully, at which point we can thaw and we can let that water flow. <laughs> But we have to freeze solid. We got to go into our solidity for a moment just to see the beauty. And that's, I think, why patients keep taking one more breath. I've wondered it so many times, and it just came to me just a few months ago, maybe why. But I've been dumbfounded in these last minutes and hours of life. You see patients stop breathing. They won't breathe for, you know, 40 seconds, minute and a half. And you're like, all right, that was the last breath. They're dead. And then, damn it, they take another huge breath. And they throw their head back and they take this breath. And they're unconscious. They seem to be gone. And you're like, why the hell did they take another breath? Like, they only got a few left. Like, what's the difference of dying right now and dying in 15 minutes? Like, their brain's not going to turn back on. What are they doing taking that extra breath? Think about it for a second. You're about to die. You're about to let go of this physical structure that has been your vessel for 50 years, 100 years, whatever it is. And in the moment that you start to let go of it, then everything does go still. At the cellular, atomic level of that, that vessel starts to go completely still. And it's still a living column of water, which means you must be able to see a million rainbows per millimeter. And at the highest self level, that's now an infinite being peering down into its own vessel and seeing millions of rainbows refracted in trillions of cells. It just wants to see it one more time, so it takes one more breath. And it feels so good to take that breath because you just allowed what was completely still to move again for a moment, and the movement feels so exquisite, and it lights things up in such a new way. And you see all the rainbows move and, and turn liquid. And then they stop breathing for another minute or two. And the soul is looking out into the other side of the scape of universe, reality, whatever it is, and it must be beautiful what they're seeing. But then they look back and they see the million rainbows and they're like, I'm going to flow one more time. And they take that one more breath. It won't surprise me if I get to my freedom on the other side of this biologic veil to, to realize I didn't see my full beauty until I saw my complete stillness in my death. And then I appreciated at that moment what the finite journey had really been for. And I will be such a fulfilled soul for having done a biologic finite moment of expression of a higher self that had been so eager to taste the coffee and to feel the kiss and to wrap my hugs around somebody. Mm -hmm. And I had done that journey just for those exquisite moments. And I never heard anybody at the bedside talking about their bank account or their resume. They only talked about human relationships and nature. That's all I ever heard about at the death side. You know, my relationship with this person, you know, then my kid or whatever. I did this hike with my dad and I remember what it felt like to, to go fishing with my dad when I was a kid. Like I heard all these exquisite stories. I also heard the other side of that too. You know, I heard a lot of vets talking about being in the belly of a B B-52 bomber and pulling the, pulling the trigger and hearing the, hearing the bomb doors open and watching the bombs fall through the scope as they looked down on a city they'd never been in and watched annihilation happen and they felt the beauty of that too like frozen in space the annihilation of humans below giving space for a new humanity to come forth as they healed the original wound as they came to terms with the trauma that we kept inflecting on one another it was all beautiful you know in those last few seconds everything gets beautiful they remember what it felt like to be in that b-52 and feel feel closer than family to the other 11 guys in the plane that just flew on a mission where they assumed none of them were coming home. And they thought they'd all be dead that day. And here he is 80 years later, surprised that he's still alive and wants to tell you about the beauty of that 80 years that he didn't think he would ever have, you know? So you hear exquisite stories at the bedside, but, but it's always about being with other humans or mm -hmm. witnessing nature around us. So we have an opportunity to see every place is sacred. And for this, resolve the desecration of the earth that we live on. And uh, 
most of all, I would encourage all of us as we go to sleep tonight, and I'm going to keep myself in this prayer too, is I really hope that I go to sleep tonight with an exquisite awareness of how good it is to be still and to be witness to the rainbows within me and to surrender whatever needs to be expressed tomorrow as my infinite self chooses another perfect path tomorrow that I can't imagine to surrender all of that next thing so that I can just be present tonight and feel one more breath before I slip away from my body. And when I'm taking that last breath of consciousness, I hope I look back down inside of me to see how beautiful I am when I'm still. And for that, I'll live more thoroughly today and, and rebirth tomorrow for a better, better version of myself. Mm. Just going to sit in a pause for a second to allow that to really land. Never in my life in a conversation have I received the blessing of what it truly means to be alive through words mm -hmm. in the way that you have delivered today. Mm -hmm. It's almost like there has been, um, the lenses have been cleared to really receive that that is already here and really continue to reiterate the mantra that the most sacred thing is what is. In every moment, in every breath, whatever arises, whether it's internally or externally, it's got a sacred purpose and in the softening is when we can receive the gift. But when we become hard or we think that it's supposed to be different, this is when actually it will continue to perpetuate until the lesson has been learned. And so just softening our bodies to receive that the most sacred thing is what is. It's right here, right now in this breath. And every single person right in front of us is God wrapped in physical form and an opportunity to meet ourselves in a different way. When we can open up our hearts, we can receive God. We can receive the goddess and we can receive the magic and we can receive spirit and then we can receive heaven on earth mm. through the person right in front of us, through the situation right in front of us, mm. no matter what it is, without judging it and allowing it to be released into the non-binary experience of the blessing that it is. Mm. So well said. Mm. It's such a relief to know that it's all finished. Like that's, you know, that was Christ's last words too. It was finished. Mm because it feels like there's so much to be done, you know, and to realize that our concept of time as three-dimensional creatures is a construct of our limitations of perspective is such a relief to realize that heaven on earth already arrived, already here. I'm already the perfected version of myself. The original math that, that allowed me to last for eons is still right here within me. And my biology is ready to emerge again tomorrow for my more perfect math for, for my surrender of my negative emotions towards self or my perceived failures or whatever it is. And so you're speaking of something that already exists here, as you have said. And I think we can just all just exhale for that. Like, my gosh, no more doing, just being. And uh, we, we're going to light this place up. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really beautiful place to close out the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and it almost feels like the, the cherry on top of the cake that has multi-layered cake. It's really <laughs> deep and rich and it's got lots of flavor in it. <laughs> and we've like laid it throughout this podcast and then right at the end, just that little cherry that went ding. There's a cup of coffee sitting next <laughs> to it. <laughs> Swirl it down with a cup of coffee, sweet dad. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, I am so excited about this podcast. I'm so excited for myself to be able to go back and listen to it again and again and just continue to integrate it into every fiber of my being. And um, you have expanded my capacity to feel the joy of everything that's around me. And I think that's the greatest gift you could ever give anybody. And so thank you for allowing me to meet myself in the miraculous nature of what it truly means to be human through your words. <laughs> Amen to that one. Thank you for allowing me to express my own beauty. <laughs> As we sit around, a cherry blossom tree with some white roses. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> the hand of God. might be on earth. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, so, for all of those beings that are watching, that you are new to them and uh, they have just discovered this wellspring of magic <laughs> in you in, in human form under the name of Zach Bush, um, how do people find you through social media or your website so that they can tune in? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, the nuts and bolts there. Zach Bush, uh, Z-A-C-H-B-U-S-H-M-D.com. That's where all my kind of education content and connection to a bunch of my podcasts and all that are there. And um, there, we do something called the Global Health Education Summit that we kicked off at the beginning of the pandemic to do deep dives of kind of investigative journalism of what is what are viruses, what are these, what are, you know, what are, everything you've that's been demonized by Western medicine. I, I want to release you of all that fear to show you the beauty within all of it. And there's nothing more beautiful than the potential that sits here on Earth in the form of viruses. It is literally the expression of the divine in the potential that biology has to birth something more beautiful than we can possibly imagine. And we have demonized this this very language of potential that has uh, been the the matrix of biology since our origin. And so there's an opportunity for you to take a different look at a world that has, you know, beat fear and guilt and shame into you. And we look at cancer and heart disease and a bunch of different topics uh, in that. We look at autism deeply. Uh, and sometimes it's just me giving kind of investigative journalism kind of approach and showing you a bunch of science. But oftentimes it's, uh, it's panels of people um, and oftentimes not just scientists, but my patients and mothers of autistic children, et cetera giving you such deep wisdom through their journey. Um, so there's an opportunity for you to connect there to a whole community that have been, you know, debunking the fear of our own biology. Um, and I think that's the ultimate biohacking. When we stop fearing the state of being alive and see it, you know, we, we've been trained to think of it as a scarcity event. And so when we cling to life, we choke it and we shorten it. Uh, when, we, when we release our, our, our death grip on life, uh, we suddenly become so biologically regenerative; it's it's almost obscene. So um, that's that's a place to find it. Um, we've got an eight week program for people who are finding a hard time to f- surround yourself by a group of people that that believe in your capacity to heal completely and th- through yourself. Um, journey of Intrinsic Health dot com. It, it's a eight week journey with coaching and community around you the whole time. And uh, it's just birthed so much beauty in these eight-week journeys. You know, just two short months to reprogram decades of, of belief of scarcity, belief of brokenness, and to find people becoming whole so fast on these journeys is a really exquisite thing to witness. So those are a couple of places you can find us if you're interested in more on the science side of the microbiome, you know, that lights up human cells into these regenerative centers, the intelligenceofnature.com is where we have all that science in the, in the microbial communication network, which is a dietary supplement uh, that you can drink. And there's also a skin one, there's sinus care and everything else. So new ways of understanding human biology in the context of the organic garden of being alive. If you're interested in helping support us in our mission to make regenerative agriculture and food systems the norm for the world, um, you can go to farmersfootprint.us. If you're in Australia, it's farmersfootprint.org.au. Um, but uh, help us you know, accelerate this journey into our understanding of the beauty beneath our feet as we really embrace the, the potential of life within our soil and food systems. Each of you eat a few times a day, which means you are an engaged participant in the future of, of this planet. And it's going to happen through the way in which you relate to the soil through your food. And uh, so go on a deep dive there. There's an incredible look through the eyes of farmers who are making this transition. And I, I'm excited for you to hear from them you know, a different take on the beauty we've talked about today through the lens of a microscope, you're going to see that same beauty through the lens of a naturalist who calls himself a farmer to realize he no longer has to micromanage nature, but needs to let nature be released on on the land that they steward. And suddenly life becomes so abundant, their finances become so abundant. And so it's just a complete reversal of life. So hearing that story from farmer after farmer is a powerful testimony to Earth's eagerness to shed her grace on us for all the harm we've done on her soil. She's so quick to forgive. She's so quick to give Mm. beyond our wildest dreams uh, an abundance that we just can't metric in a modern society of food and ingredients and calories and all these, you know, diminutive, uh, you know, structures of metrics that we use. So tap into the beauty uh, across all those spaces. But if you really want to find me, then you're just going to walk out into the woods and you're going to smell this the earth and you're gonna see your own beauty for a moment and in a deep way you're gonna you're gonna encounter me there a lot easier than you will on some website or something like that we are all connected people we are all so connected 
the perception that we need in social media or you know these other constructs is those are just low vibration expressions of our desire to connect we have a high vibration capacity to receive each other and it's not found behind technology it is found back in the analog state of being alive in nature and uh if you will walk out and maybe there's just one tree near your apartment or wherever you're living. And if you can lay down on the ground, just look up through the branches of that tree. I hope you do this in winter when the leaves are gone and you look up through the, the, the exquisite quantum physics patterns of branches. And then just welcome yourself into the information that you just heard on this podcast and just realize that you are part of that beauty and for that, you're going to know me so well because I'm just another iteration of you and you're going to you're gonna fall so deeply in love with me because you'll forget I had a name and you'll forget I had a face different than yours and you will just be so in love with yourself. And so I look forward to giving up you know, all of it, and the social media, the websites and the products and everything else that are palliating right now our disconnect from our true beauty. And so I can't wait to the day where we all go out of business because we realized there was nothing more to create and there was only life to be experienced. And we spent all of our time watching nature pour bountiful amounts of food into the tables of the world so that we would sit around and fellowship around this food, tasting it together, laughing together, telling story together and being so amazed by the exquisite reality of being alive in that moment and we will not work because nature already figured that whole transmutation of energy into beauty of biology and beauty of life and uh, we will stop palliating our sense of disconnect from nature by more and more consumerism and we will become producers by simply being witness mm. to the beauty that we live in so go find me on under a tree or go find me at a dinner table and be witness to your own miraculous next breath find your beauty oh there we have it our sacred responsibility to allow ourselves to receive the gift of what's already here and meet zach bush in a bush <laughs> somewhere <laughs> <laughs> I love that you couldn't help that one. I, I that. had to. <laughs> <laughs> There's no dry eye in the house right now. <laughs> Got Rachel crying behind the scenes. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. For sister. everything that you are, for the extensive study, the deep devotion, for cleaning out your vessel to allow yourself to be the hollow bone, for the exquisite message that flow, flows through you and that allows us to be able to uh, meet ourselves through your devotion. And it is truly an honor. I have been in a deep portal <laughs> listening to you. There's nothing else that exists right now besides <laughs> your presence and the words that are coming out of your mouth. Mm. And I am so honored that you came on the Deja Blue podcast and that you, sh you shared your, your magic or the magic that is flowing through you with all of those that are listening. Um, what a true gift. And this is the truest essence in my heart of what media as medicine truly is. So mm. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you in all of the ways. So glad to be alive with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, beautiful bloomers. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the Deja Blue podcast. If today resonated with you, which I'm sure that it will, um, then uh, we uh, then please tune in and share this podcast across all of your platforms <laughs> on um, on Instagram stories, on any way that you feel like this message can be able to reach more people. Uh, because I truly believe this is the universal message that is needed to be heard by so many. So sending you so much love into your day and may you absorb all of this nutrients into every 70 trillion cells of your body and may you live a life of absolute joy, recognizing that there's so much magic laced in the mundane. And until next week, Thanks for tuning in. Today's sponsor of this podcast is Becoming Prosperous, which is a four-week online self-guided course aligning you with what it truly means to live a prosperous life. So if you want to check out the link it, it, in the show notes here on YouTube and also on all podcasting Audible platforms.